Hello and welcome to worship with the community of First Congregational Church of Boulder, United Church of Christ, on this day where we celebrate our Access Sunday. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term Access Sunday, whether you're here or whether you're online, um, this is the day when we honor our accessible to all covenant. Like all of our covenants, this covenant is a promise that we've made to one another to continually work towards extending God's extravagant welcome to all people. In this light, we seek to understand, include, and empower people with differing abilities and disabilities, apparent or unapparent. In our work to widen the welcome, we uh, fellowship together in increasingly creative ways. And we look to break down any barriers to fellowship that we might have and look for ways to reimagine how we can draw closer to one another in community and worship. With your commitment and the leadership of our Accessible to All ministry, we have made tremendous strides, such as adding ramps, an elevator, a hearing loop, and more to provide greater access to the sanctuary. But we realize that there are always other opportunities. And now, uh, due to the challenges of the pandemic, we have become even more aware of growing edges and how we can respond to them. In our worship this morning, all of the music was composed by people with diff different abilities and disabilities. Minister Kevin Pettit here, who we all know and love, and with whom our church is in a four-way covenant with his work for Faith for All, is serving as liturgist and also offering a sermonette. As you will likely notice, uh, there will be some changes to the service that are not reflected in the bulletin. Uh, due to a family member being exposed to someone who tested positive for COVID, uh, Rebecca has said that it's okay to let you know that she will not be playing or singing today. However, the music for the prelude and the postlude uh, are by Fanny Crosby and John Stanley, both of whom were blind. I would like to also point out that today's flowers are in honor of Pat Oswalt, who is celebrating her 95th birthday today. <laughs> Happy birthday to Pat. <laughs> we had some other uh, birthdays this week. Um, uh, Shirley Whiteley made it, and she's 90 this week. She was 90, well, last week on Wednesday. So we have a lot of, I don't know what the generian part is, but 90 generian, so. Hey, it's a good place if you want to live long. <laughs> um, in this time together, let us be grateful that we've all been called to this moment wherever and whenever we find ourselves joining. And we've been called to open our hearts and our minds to the spirit of inclusion that makes room for all. With God's grace and all of our compassion, we keep taking steps toward the manifestation of God's beloved community on earth. So welcome and may the peace of Christ be with you. And now I invite you to join me in our call to worship, which are quotes from different people who were either born with or acquired disabilities in their lifetime. The wisdom of our souls tells us that optimism is the faith that leads to achievement. Nothing can be done without hope and confidence. For as a person thinks, so are they. It's the repetition of affirmations that leads to belief. And once that belief becomes a deep conviction, things begin to happen. Because although we can't change the direction of the wind, we can adjust our sails to always reach our destination. Amen.
preparing for this Access Sunday program, thinking we reflect on the implications or interpretations of the plague, there I searched our Bible for readings about the interpretations. There are as many as 75 references in the Bible to plagues visited upon or threatened toward Israel's enemies or and, and unrighteous or even simply erring Israelites. This understanding of plagues wasn't restricted to, to only the ancient Israelites. Many, that is 14, references to plagues came from the New Testament as well. However, you all know about how many of our religious forebears understood the incidence of plagues as a consequence of sin and a vengeful God. And little new learning comes from reading these ghastly tales. Following the wisdom and more experienced guidance of our associate minister, both Pedro and I consulted productively, I think, the revised common lectionary, which include, included today's reading, which is about wisdom and discernment. Now, I'll read for you today a passage from the book of 1 Kings, chapter 3, verses 3 through 12. Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of his father David. Only he sacrificed and offered incense at the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the principal high place. Solomon used to offer thousands, a thousand burnt offerings on the altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I should give you. And Solomon said, You have shown great and steadfast love to your servant, my father David, because he walked before you in faithfulness, in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you have kept him for, for, from this great and steadfast love, and have given him a son to sit on his throne today. And now, O Lord my God, you have made a, your servant ki ki a king in place of my father David, although I am only a child, a little child. I do not know how to go out or come in, and your servant is in the midst of the people whom you have chosen, a great people, so numerous they cannot be numbered or counted. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind to govern your people, able to discern what is good and evil, for who can govern this your great people? It pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. God said to him, Because you have asked this, and you have not asked for yourself a long life or riches, or for the life of your enemies, but you have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Now, I, I now do accord you to your word. Indeed, I give to you, you a wise and discerning mind. No one like you has been before you, and no one like you shall arise after you. Thus ends our reading. Now for a little switch, a little bit. We don't want to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic today. The COVID-19 pandemic has meant many different things to different people. Fairly early in this pandemic, as was reported by the AP on May 15th, 2020, and evidenced by the results of a poll by the University of Chicago Divinity School, quote, the coronavirus has prompted almost two-thirds of American believers of all faiths to feel that God is telling humanity to change how it lives. I feel that the divine interacts daily with us all, even though most of us are unaware of how. While no reasonable person can disagree regarding the fact of the existence of COVID-19 pandemic, we each develop our own understanding of its effect and what it means to us. I come to you this morning, a day this year, that our church has chosen to celebrate as Access Sunday to ask you to consider the many different ways the, this COVID-19 pandemic has affected each of us. What has the COVID pandemic meant to you? Now, meaning of anything is not a required or implied fact. 
Meaning is an individual human construction. Meaning is a useful summarization of our individual understandings of the implications of a thing, which often suggest future action. Meaning belongs to the person considering the thing, not to the thing itself. And boy, we humans sure are compulsive meaning makers. This morning, we are taking a break from the usual sermon style of delivery by a single individual speaker and are taking a high-tech tag team approach to the sermon. For today's sermon, I have invited the Reverend Marta Fioriti and Dr. Mandy Todd of Black Forest Community Church and Ms. Kelly Tobin of the organization Faith for All to tell us one way they, e they each understand this pandemic to have affected them in their particular context and how they have responded to it, the pandemic. The message from the Black Forest Community Church will be delivered to us via video. However, due to circumstances beyond her control, Ms. Tobin was unable to complete or record a video of her sermonette. Thus, I will have taken many of the ideas we discussed and incorporated them into what I will say. This will be followed by a final sermonette by our associate pastor. Let's now learn from some alternate ways to understand the meaning or effect of this COVID-19 pandemic by considering one response to it. I'm Marta, the pastor of Black Forest Community Church. And I'm, and I'm Mandy, Mandy director, director of Worship, of Worship and, Arts. and Arts. Black Forest, Black Forest Community, Community Church, Church is a small, is a small but, mighty but mighty congregation nestled, nestled in the heart of the Black Forest, Black Forest a, relatively a relatively rural and fairly, fairly conservative area, surrounded, surrounded by what, what has developed over, over the last 20 years to be significant, significant suburban, suburban sprawl. sprawl. The, congregation the congregation has been around since 1937 and over the last few years has begun to fully embrace its roots in the United Church of Christ. In March of 2020, we, along with the congregation, closed the physical doors in response to the developing pandemic. Like the rest of the country, we thought it would be just a few weeks. We did not have the resources or tools we needed to thrive in the normal way, and it provided an opportunity to do things differently. We knew we could not replicate virtually the traditional liturgy that we practice in the sanctuary and our collective leadership style grounded in enthusiasm and curiosity led us to embrace a different model that fed our needs as the leaders of this congregation to be creative to explore what ministry in a pandemic could be. By doing that, Mandy and I were energized to lead this congregation well. It was a shift from the pre-pandemic focus on the health and well-being of the congregation to the pandemic focus on our well-being as leaders. It worked because we remained excited about doing the work and bringing others along with us. Every six to eight weeks, we shifted church. This kept the congregation on their toes. Instead of feeling exhausted, overworked, and bored, Marta and I had the energy to wonder what we would do next. We knew that the winter of 2020 would bring a different vibe. People were wary of pandemic life. It was too cold to go outside and virtual gatherings were getting old. With the help of the congregation, we decided to do two things that would serve the purpose and vision of Black Forest Community Church. Since the building was not being used, we decided to do something radical, advanced missions at its best. The church partnered with the Colorado Springs Sanctuary Coalition and Accompaniment Program to house an undocumented family in the bottom of the main church building. The congregation came together in small groups to clean and transform that space into an apartment. They created two bedrooms, a sitting area, dining area, and the use of the fellowship hall kitchen and bathrooms. It gave the church purpose and it took everyone to make it happen. We hosted a mother and her four children for six months. Concurrently, we set out to rethink adult faith formation and worship while also using this time to try our hand at something new. 
Since BFCC is a small, semi-rural congregation, we were impaired by lack of monetary resources and live streaming video access. Fiber optic cable is not accessible throughout the Black Forest. We also knew that providing some virtual media access to the work of the church was important. Using a $1,000 grant from the Rocky Mountain Conference, we began a podcast called Jesus Has Left the Building. Honing in on our core values of relationship and creativity, we wanted to share the platform with others doing really interesting things. We understood that the pandemic meant that Jesus has left the building and we wanted to go with him out into the world. And we wanted to bring everyone else along too. To the podcast Jesus Has Left the Building, where we talk with people all over the nation, leading creative, outside the box, I mean outside the church building, ministries that inspire and engage us. And we talk with people about why they have decided to create new and transforming ministries, especially during times such as these. This is the Jesus Has Left the Building podcast where ministers, writers, activists, and church leaders have left the building too, with Marta and Mandy. Access to church during the pandemic means that worship and liturgy are fluid and community-centered rather than preacher-centered. Access to church during the pandemic means that we measure success in percentages of engagement, connectives, and vibrancy, rather than with raw data and individual attendance. Access to church during the pandemic means giving up control and handing over personal agency and accountability. Providing access to church during the pandemic was an act of faith. That's one way you can respond to the pandemic. While this COVID pandemic has devastated the lives of many people in this country, and and it has perhaps affected people living with disabilities more than any other group in this country because of the segregation of our society, the severity of the devastation of COVID-19 amongst people with disabilities is evidenced by the effect of COVID-19 on the nursing home population. Congregate living facilities like nursing homes, facilities that those people with disabilities in favor of community integration have long fought to close, have to a large extent driven the spread of the the pandemic. More evidence of the severity of the COVID-19 pandemic to people with disabilities was recently reported in the New England Journal of Medicine. And it says, quote, A study across 547 U.S. healthcare organizations finds that individuals with intellectual disabilities are at substantially increased risk for dying from COVID-19. Now, in some significant ways, there are parallels between effects that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on all of us in society and and the effects of disability can have on people with, with, with disabilities. Consider the lockdown. During the lockdown, many people felt restricted to their homes. This has been a frustration for some people, even with disabilities, even long before the pandemic. During the lockdown, quite a bit of business and even personal interactions were conducted via video or phone chat. In this way, all our personal restrictions were limited or restricted. This is how some people with disabilities always interact with most all others. During this pandemic, many people have been required to follow mask mandates and found it difficult to read others because we couldn't see their faces completely. I have been told that this inability to read others' emotions is sometimes a marker of an autistic spectrum disorder, or ASD. Many people with ASD have difficulty reading facial expressions and body language. Much like what we've all found as a result of wearing face masks, many people with ASD find it hard to interpret and or respond to other people's feelings. So in a way, 
COVID has leveled the playing field because the challenges imposed by, on everyone are similar to some of the challenges imposed by different disabilities and our society's architectural and attitudinal barriers. The frustration many have felt as a result of this pandemic may be similar to the frustrations that some people who live with, with disabilities always have. One important difference is that as more and more people become inoculated against the coronavirus, and as our fears are reasonably lessened, many of us can relax into a less fearful and less constricted lifestyle. However, this is never possible for many people who are restricted considerably by a disability and by our society's restrictive expectations, efforts, and hopes of them. Yet, some societal changes wrought by the COVID-19 pandemic have, unwittingly, actually advanced causes fought for by people with disabilities for decades. These cultural shifts have enabled the further integration of people with disabilities into the mainstream, the right to work from home, the access to telehealth appointments when office encounters are unnecessary, and especially the right to insurance coverage for home health care services, in which most cases reduces the total expense bill to insurance companies and relieves the pressure on hospitals during this pandemic. It saves the clients money and increases their quality of life as well. A significant fraction of the congregation listening to this service are joining us online. Many people can now do this at other churches as well. This ability was installed, at this church at least, in response to the pandemic. Enjoying services online helps churches reach out to those distanced or unable to attend churches, the church for other reasons. Thus, because of one of this church's responses to the pandemic, we can include members with disabilities or particular neurological needs to a greater extent and more easily invite a wider group to at attend a church with us. In this way, we are more truly becoming accessible to all. Because of this pandemic, my friend Kelly has also been able to enjoy adaptive yoga classes online. Many more stores have developed service option of delivering their products to our houses as a result of the pandemic. What, what are now almost cultural norms were previously unable, unavailable or very hard to come by. There are other gifts of the pandemic. Because of our disabilities and the pandemic, both Kelly and I have slowed down the pace of our lives. Have you found the ability to slow down your life helpful as well? Because of the pandemic, we have seen the increased acceptance and sometimes requirement of working from home, a possibility long advocated for by people living with disabilities. I bet some of you have, in, have enjoyed not having to commute to work for this last year. Because of COVID-19, Americans seem to be expressing more clearly compassion towards others who found themselves in humbled positions. I have heard stories of neighbors supporting and assisting unknown neighbors. Have you tried to reach out and to help others more, even if remotely, because of this pandemic? I wonder how we can make the, these effects permanent in developed nations, those nations lucky enough to have healthcare infrastructure enabling widespread vaccinations. And as, as people begin to return to more pre-pandemic cultural norms, people with disabilities are like canaries in, in coal mines. Just think of how much more prepared for the pandemic our country would have been if the voices of people with disabilities asking for accessibility and accommodations had been heeded when their request was clearly voiced. How can we learn from people living with disabilities whose adaptable skills and nature was developed because of their particular challenge? We can start by welcoming them into our lives, hearing and responding to what they have to say listening to people with disabilities and learning their perspective can, perhaps, help us develop the wisdom of Solomon. Thank you, Kevin. <clears throat> when I was a child, 
Uh, this scripture passage from 1 Kings about Solomon's prayer for wisdom and understanding mind to govern and the ability to discern between good and evil was one of my favorites. I would love to say that my motives were 100% free from any of the capitalistic strivings that become part and parcel of just being here, um, but I did grow up like most of us in a materially centered, production-driven society that often chooses profits over people. So um, I imagine that part of the reason I like the story was because in verse 13, which we didn't read this morning, uh, the creator says to Solomon, I give you also what you have not asked, both riches and honor all your life. No other king shall compare to you. I can still see the image we were given of Solomon in our Bible lesson books, him sitting on a golden throne, making wise judgments and thinking that I hope to turn out like him someday, minus the downfall that he would later have. And so I prayed for wisdom, an understanding mind to govern, and the ability to discern between good and evil, with the little hope that I might trick God into giving me everything else that I didn't ask for. And isn't that how we often do things? When I worked in the corporate world, we used to talk about the WIFM factor. Have any of you ever heard of the WIFM factor? W-I-I-F-M, what's in it for me? That was a common refrain when we would talk about different exchanges and negotiations. They were like, what's the with them? What's the with them factor? What's in it for me? Another way of putting that would be giving to get. As Kevin so clearly pointed out in his message this morning, many of our society's responses to the pandemic were initiatives, initiatives requested by people with disabilities prior to market demand. They asked for more re remote work options, access to gatherings where decisions are made without having to make travel arrangements that are often unnecessary in this day and age. And they've asked for so much more. And it's not that we couldn't do it. Clearly we could. We see how rapid everyone responded to the pandemic uh, when there was no choice. But like too many things, we chose market over merit and intimidation over innovation. In her book, As a Woman, Paula Stone Williams shares lessons in her life uh, that she learned after transitioning. Prior, among, a primary among them was the privilege that she had as Paul um, that was invisible to her until she emerged as Paula. When she discusses some of the COVID responses that she hopes remain after this is over, if it ever will be, was the remote work opportunities because of what it offers parents with young children, most especially women still to this day, many of whom also requested more options like this prior to the pandemic. In writing my thoughts on lessons from the pandemic as it relates to people with disabilities, I tried my best to avoid using the term, the least of these. That's the term that Jesus used when he said, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done to me. As someone who would fall in the category of the least of these from the uh, majority society perspective, I've always felt that there was something diminishing about that phrase. But after reading Kevin's work and Paula's point of view on some lessons from COVID, I thought about how often those whose requests are ignored are not least in capacity or least in vision and most definitely not least in worth, but rather they're simply the least in numbers. To put it simply, they make up the smallest market segment. Again, my friends, as we said last week, these things ought not to be so. If there's one lesson that I would hope that we learn from this pandemic, it would be the one the Apostle Paul articulated in 1 Corinthians 12, which is that in reality, we are one body with many members, many gifts coming from one spirit. And if one member suffers, all members suffer with us. And if one member is honored, if one member is lifted up, all the members rejoice with it. What was it said of Christ? If I be lifted up, then I will draw all people unto me. And so may we lift up for the sake of the entire body. This is what wisdom teaches us. And wisdom who we learned was Sophia last week we know that Sophia, she, wisdom, never lies. 
One final thing that I would like you to hold in your heart is I've mentioned uh, in trying to understand what it takes to be a non-anxious presence in a very anxious world, I've been looking into family systems theory. And so I decided to take a family systems approach to looking at today's scripture. I wondered why someone in a privileged position like Solomon would pray such a prayer. So I looked at his father a little more deeply and in doing so, I was reminded that David, though pursued unjustly by his predecessor, Saul, when David had ascended to the throne, he looked for someone from his enemy's family that he could be a blessing to. Who he found was uh, Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan and grandson of Saul. Uh, Mephibosheth, which is a mouthful to say, <laughs> had become disabled when his nurse dropped him while fleeing Jerusalem in fear of retribution for how his family had treated David. But rather than harm Saul's descendant, David restored the inheritance that would have gone to Mephibosheth and brought him to the palace to live. What would you call that in modern times? He took someone who was suffering and struggling because of the battle between their families and he brought them back and restored them. And I see plenty of opportunities for us and I'm not gonna spell them out for you but I'm gonna invite you to look for those opportunities in your day-to-day -day life. But that's what he did. And this is an example, a, a example of what I imagine Solomon witnessed. Furthermore, Mephibosheth became the father of Micah, the prophet, who we attribute the often quoted words, and what does the Creator require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God? Someone who may have been forgotten in other circumstances, who would have been left on the margins, or who would have been seen as cursed because of sin, because of something that happened to them. And yet, how often do we use his progeny's words in our call? With this kind of exposure and proximity, which I say with emphasis, I can only imagine that Solomon's prayer was indicative of the family system he was a part of, where he learned from the failings and successes of those closest to him and prayed to continue that legacy. And so the invitation to you today is to be in wonder about how we can proactively live into the legacy of the lessons learned from the pandemic by adding your vision to ours for the building up of the beloved community to which we have all been called. When one of us suffers, we all suffer. And when any one of us who sometimes are called the least of these are lifted up, we all ascend in honor and to the inheritance that we've all been called to as children of God. May we be mindful of this. Amen.